Hello and welcome to episode 59 of Geek and Speak, the Geek and Seek podcast. There we go. I, I, I nailed it that time. I definitely didn't have to do a second take. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about all of the brand new cards from the Commander Precons from the new set, Bloomboro. Wow, that's a lot of words to talk about what we are talking about today. Uh, join with me today is Preston. Preston, how's it going, man? Going pretty good. Uh, this is definitely the best set of the year, and I'm excited that we get to talk about it a little more. Couldn't agree more. Uh, Jason, how's it going? It's going good. Best set of the year? I didn't. I haven't thought about it. I haven't thought about it yet, but man, I, th- I think you're right. Yeah, and uh, I am I am your host, Morgan. Uh, we will have to revisit that topic when we do our, uh, our, our wrap-up of the year favorite of the year podcast episode uh, in, a, in a few months. But I, I think Preston's right. I think this is going to have to go down as the best set of the year uh, the, the, between the main set, a lot of these new cards in the commander pre-cons. There's just a lot of really fun stuff, decent power level, adorable art, epic art. Uh, it's good stuff. I'm here for it. Uh, if you would like to support the show, you can do all the YouTube algorithm stuff like liking this video, sharing it with a friend, making sure you're subscribed if you're not already, leaving helpful comments, all that Jimmy Jazz. And if you want to uh, go the extra mile in supporting us, uh, you can head over to patreon.com slash YouTube. Also, feel free to join our Discord. You can find a link to that in the description of this video. And favorite comment of the week, real quick, because I forgot to mention this uh, over the last couple episodes. Uh, This is from Ryan Roper. Uh, Saw Morgan on the last MTG Goldfish uh, podcast and found your channel from there. Been binge watching your content and loving it. Hey, uh, thanks for the support. Hope you've been enjoying our content. Uh, Yeah, if you guys didn't know, the last three episodes of the Commander Clash podcast I've been on, uh, so that's pretty cool. If you like MTG Goldfish and you like their Commander content, uh, check me out over there as well. I've been editing over there for the last almost year, so it's kind of cool to be on camera now over there as well. All right, let's go ahead and jump into this because we have a lot of cards to talk about, boys. Uh, we got, what, 40 cards to talk about. We got 10 new cards from each precon. There's four new precons. Uh, we will go alphabetical through every card from each precon. So let's go ahead and start off with Animated Army, the face commander of that deck. Uh, Preston, do you want to take this one? Yeah, I'll get us started. So first up, we have Bellow, Bard of the Brambles. For one, a red and a green. 3-3 three, three legendary creature raccoon bard. During your turn, each non-equipment artifact and each non-ore enchantment you control with mana value 4 or greater is a 4-4 four, four elemental creature in addition to its other types and has indestructible haste and whenever this creature deals combat damage to a player, draw a card. You know, this is a really cool new commander option turning all of your big enchantments into beefy beaters that you don't have to worry about, you know, losing because they have indestructible card draw. It's just everything you want in a commander. It's something new, uh, something fun that people like, you know, people love enchanters this deck. So this is going to be a fun one, I think. Yeah. Also, it's, it's go ahead. Also turning green into like an artifact theme deck. That could be fun. I don't know that there's a whole lot of, like, really good, like, well, non-Simic green decks. Like, this is, how many other Gruul artifact commanders are there? This is kind of the first one. Yeah, that's kind of crazy. Like, I'm excited. This is a really, really cool dude, and he's a 3, 3 for 3. I love that stuff, man. So this reminds me a lot of, there's a couple blue cards that do a similar thing. There's uh, Rise and Shine and Cyber Drive Awakener, which are cards that they will uh, animate your uh, non-creature artifacts into creatures for the turn. So you can like go in smack face. This is like a Gruul card that kind of does the same thing. It's really interesting. And I really like that this is a, there's really just not a lot of green commanders in general that care about artifacts and enchantments. Uh, well, I guess enchantments, there's plenty of green support, but like artifacts specifically. And the fact that this one uh, really pushes you to play big, scary artifacts and enchantments. I actually kind of love this. I might have to pick up this precon if I'm being honest. Uh, Jason, do you want to lead us through the backup commander for the precon? Yeah, so the backup commander for the precon is Wild Spear, Scourging Maw. It's a legendary elemental wolf, 
It's five mana, three and uh, one red, one green for a six, six with trample. And it says enchantment spells you cast from your hand have cascade. Um, cascade, you cast the spell, you reveal cards for the top of your library. You play the first card that you reveal that costs at least one mana less than wild spear. Uh, five mana for a six, six with trample. I like that. I always look at commanders like that at that point, at that perspective first. Like, is it worth it to play as a creature? Which, yes. And, holy crap, enchantments have have Cascade? You know, a lot of the times they they build the, uh, they design the backup commanders to be somewhat different from the main commander, so you have the opportunity to build a completely separate deck. But it's like, why would you ever not have one of these in the in the deck like if wild spear is your commander you have bellow in the in the deck if bellow is your commander wild spear is in your deck they work so well together and really it's it's like this is a commander that you play kind of as soon as you can because it's five mana so you want to get him out um and i feel like the difference with that in bellow is bellow you can have it sit in the command zone until you've built up a board state and then you cast him, and now you're like swinging in with all your artifacts that you just turned into creatures. It's really, really cool. I love that they synergize so well together. Y yeah, there I, is. I... Go ahead, Preston. Oh, I was gonna say there is one option with him where they don't work well together. Uh, Wild Seer would be very good as a Voltron or Commander. I will say that because you basically get to go get a free second aura. So if you want to do that, they don't work well together. But if you're just like, yeah. I want to play big, dumb enchantments, because Bella they're doesn't be, check they're going to work together. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's what I was going to say. The only other thing I would add, uh, other other than what Preston said, is that Gruul also has gotten a lot of new support for playing things from Exile. So like, I think it was two years ago, we had the Faldorn precon, which was a Gruul deck that cared all about playing stuff from exile i used to have a faldorn deck it was pretty cool it's like gruel prosper so you could kind of go that as like your sub theme so i think wild seer is actually a very interesting commander because you could kind of do like the auras voltrony build but then also have like some of that play stuff from exile stuff because cascading is casting stuff from exile so quick cool question. stuff you can do there Quick question. Do you guys think that you play this in other enchantment decks that can run this card? Or do you strictly just build this in a, as a, as the commander or for a deck like this? Uh, Maybe. So two caveats is that I don't think there's a ton of red enchantment decks unless you're like playing five color, right? Um, But it's it's it itself is not an enchantment. So that that is a knock against it synergy wise, but I mean, assuming it gets to stick around, it would be a lot of value. So I think it depends. All right, uh, so this is the first non commander for that deck. This is Alchemist Talent. It's a class enchantment for three and a red. Uh, gains the next level as a sorcery uh, to add its ability. So these abilities stack on top of each other when it comes in. Uh, it automatically at level one has, uh, when it enters, create two tapped treasure tokens. Then for one and a red, treasure tokens you control have sacrifice this artifact at two mana of any one color. So it's like the uh, uh, Goldspan Dragon ability. And then level three, which you can level up to for four and a red, whenever you cast a spell, if mana from a treasure was spent to cast it, this class deals damage equal to that spell's mana value to each opponent. Uh, this seems pretty straightforward. If you have treasures, if you're playing any kind of treasure deck, this probably needs to go in there because it's going to make treasures. It's going to power up your treasures. And then it kind of can turn into a win con theoretically. So, but I don't think I would, I don't, I don't think you ever play because if you are assuming it's going to be carried by the two treasures it makes you, probably not good enough but if you are playing a deck that makes a lot of treasures it's probably very good yeah i agree with that the first time i saw this card i was really kind of down on it um because it only makes two and it costs four and then you have to pay two more to level it up and it's like now you just paid six mana to get an enchantment that makes your treasures tap for two which is good but it's like i rather would have just done that all at once which i mean but there is then i i, I started to think about it more and i was like okay there's actually some slots for this in decks that actually are making a lot of treasure tokens like you're talking about. So, 
but I mean, it's all just it all just feels like prosper. Like that to me, to <laughs> yeah. me that's just what this card feels like. And eh, I'm not, I'm not, eh. It is what it is. I like it. I, I, I really like that last ability. I feel like sometimes treasure decks don't know how to end a game. Like they'll have eighteen hundred mana, a bunch of cards in hand, and yet they never seem to be able to finish the game. Sometimes, so making them actually do something is kind of nice with that last ability you know, something worthwhile pumping into. My response to that would be, I mean, if you're playing in a red deck, there's plenty of red cards that end the game. So it's, you know, the in, in those situations, it's like people just aren't putting in cards that end games. So adding this as a card that ends the game, yeah. I mean, if you're spending, uh, what is it, six, 11 mana on a spell, it should win you the game for sure. Yeah. All right. Uh, wow, that's so much mana. <laughs> uh, Preston, go ahead and uh, walk us through the next one. All right. Next up, we have Bright Cap Badger. Uh, it's a three and a green for a C4 Badger Druid. Uh, each fungus and sapling you control has tap at a green. And at the beginning of your end step, you make a 1-1 one, one green sapling creature token. And he also has an adventure for two and a green fungus frolic. Uh, it's an instant, you create two 1-1 one, one green sapling creature tokens. Uh, you know, it's sapperlings, those have a lot of good support already. I don't know if it's really good in this pre-con, but if you have a sapling deck, this is almost certainly going to go in it, you know, turn all those little guys into mana, that's going to be really gross, so it's a fun little card. Yeah, it's, it's kind of sus in this pre-con, but Sapperlings have a couple really cool commanders. Uh, it, they're semi-popular. Like, the people who like Sapperlings really like Sapperlings. It's also kind of weird that it's an adventure, but I'm also just always happy to get more adventures because I like how they play, uh, and we could they could use more support. Like, uh, Preston played the adventure commander from Wilds of Eldraine, and it, he's, he just had a hard time finding enough good adventure so like i don't know if this would necessarily make the cut but you know the more the merrier and we can fine-tune the deck later so i like that as well yeah this definitely feels to me like it was just added for commander players not necessarily for the deck specifically like this is definitely a card that you cut to make the deck better um but it's also just a really good card in other commander decks that are you know are making sapperlings or, or fungus tokens or just want to be making tokens in general I do like how it's three into four. Sometimes adventures, like they're what you're paying for each of the two doesn't really work well together, but that's a pretty good little one-two combo right there. Yeah, historically, all of the uh, adventures that get perf like pro play, I think all of them play that way, where you play the adventure mode on one turn, then the next turn you play the creature side. Yeah, and I mean, especially in the color where you're going to pay three and make four tokens. All right, Jason, what's next? So next is Evercoat Ursine. Did I say that right, you think? Ursin? Sure. Ur Ursine? <laughs> Who uh, knows? It is a elemental bear uh, for four and a green. It's a six, five with trample. It has hideaway three, hideaway three. It says whenever Evercoat Ursine deals combat damage to a player, if there are cards exiled with it, you may play one of them without paying its mana cost. Um, I mean... This card's awesome. It, like, I mean, I'm, I'm like looking at this and I'm like, is this a blue card? Is this, this is a blue card. Why does it look like that? This is a it's blue card. An, it's such an efficient, easy to cast creature that's going to smack face. And assuming it survives, you're going to get like two cards worth of value out of it. Like it's kind of insane, really. And keep in mind that hideaway, you can, like, hideaway, you don't have to worry about the mana cost. Like, it could be a freaking Eldrazi under there that you just hit away, you know? Like, you can do insane things with this card. And the fact that it's not hideaway six, it's hideaway three twice. So, like, I just, I, I like that. Um, especially because, uh, now, is that, is that, does that count as two abilities triggering when it enters? Probably not, right? Cause no, it's not cause it like... says do it, then do it again. I think right. that's all okay. part of one. Yeah, so I think if you're going to respond, you have to respond before the first one happens. You can't, like, respond in between them. 
I assume. Well, I I was I was thinking more for the like sake of like ETB triggers. Like cuz it, cuz it's not entering twice. So I guess that would yeah. So uh ob- so obviously Oh, wait a minute. I decks. just thought about this. If you put it into uh, uh a deck where you're going to double your ETB triggers, you're going to get hideaway 3, hideaway 3, hideaway 3, hideaway 3. No, that's baller. Assuming that's sweet. It gets to stick around. Assuming it gets to <laughs> stick around, and it, it seriously, it's a five mana six five with trample. You're gonna you're gonna find someone that you can get in and hit. Like someone's gonna be open enough. So, uh, this is probably good enough that you could probably play it in a lot of green decks, and it will do work. All right. Uh, speaking of treasure shenanigans, we have prosperous bandit. This is for two and a red. It's a raccoon rogue with offspring, meaning uh, when it, uh, wait, is it when you cast it? Yeah, when you cast it, you may pay an additional one. If you do, it enters uh, with a 1-1 one, one token copy of it. It's a 2-2 two, two with first strike. And whenever this creature deals combat damage to a player, create that many tapped treasure tokens. So the offspring, if it hits, will make one treasure. If the normal one hits, it will make two treasures. Uh, very good in treasure decks, but they are very small bodies, so I don't know how effectively they're going to be able to get in with that. Though I will say that if you are playing a treasure deck, especially if it is a more aggressive one, I feel like this probably makes the cut, but I don't know if I would play it outside of that. I think it's good that it's in a gruel deck because a lot of the treasure decks that exist now are red or red-black, which I don't think that this is that good for those decks, but in a gruel deck where you can power up the tokens... You get you get to double up the token creatures, stuff like that. I think it's a lot better. This uh, definitely feels like a very red card to me, and I just think Offspring is a really kind. Of, it's kind of, it feels like a broken ability, doesn't it? Uh, it's uh, I don't think it's broken, but it's pretty dang cool. It's pretty fun, and they have uh, individual tokens, um, for every card that has offspring and they're all adorable and i love them that's perfect i love it yeah this card's really cool it's gonna be really good in a lot of decks all right uh preston what is the next card in this deck all right next up we have pyre swipe hawk for three and two red it's an elemental bird creature for it's a 4-4 four, four with flying in haste. When it attacks, it gets plus X, plus 0 until end of turn, where X is the greatest mana value among artifacts you control. And whenever you expand 6, gain control of up to one target artifact for as long as you control Pyre Stripe Hawk. You expand, expend 6 as you spend your 6 total mana to cast spells during a turn. Sorry, that was a You're bit a of a mouthful. Deck. Yeah, it's, it's kind of a dumb, dumb uh, mechanic. I kind of hate it, but... Uh, you're a gruel deck that cares about like this precon, the face commander specifically cares about playing big artifacts and enchantments. So uh, this seems like one of the best cards in the precon, like without upgrades, this has got to be one of the best ones. Yeah. Cause if your commander dies, your stuff is just going to sit there doing nothing. Like they're not going to be creatures. So having this guy here, to still hit people really hard in the air is going to be very nice. Yeah. And you can steal things. Which is yeah, really fun. That too. It, it, it's... <clears throat> it's big. It's got flying. It's got haste. Um, it just it, it just still feels kind of like a, a baby Hellkite Tyrant. <laughs> it is baby Hellkite Tyrant, isn't it? You know, that's what it feels like. Yeah, um, yeah. Because, I mean, you can only do it once uh, when you when you cast the sixth mana. But, I mean, it could get huge, like, immediately. A f- five mana, four, four, flying haste, that's pretty good. But it can come down and just be massive. Like, somebody has a... Uh, uh, um, I'm trying to think of just something that's really big that doesn't have indestructible, I guess. I don't know how much this matters, but expense six is also per turn. So if you have Seedborn Muse and then you have mana up to do stuff on other people's turns, you could theoretically be doing it on everyone's turns. Or you slot this into into um, other decks that can play at instant speed, a.k.a. blue decks, like like is it decks or um, teamer decks. 
I feel like people are going to lose track of how much mana they spend, though. Yeah, that's that's probably not the easiest thing to keep track of in in paper. But uh, Jason, what's the what's the next one? So next up, we got Rolling Hamsphere. Uh, it's a <laughs> it's a vehicle. It's seven mana for a four four, uh, and it says Rolling Hamsphere gets plus one plus one for each hamster you control. And whenever Rolling Hamsphere attacks, create three one one red hamster creature tokens. Then it deals X damage to any target, where X is the number of hamsters you control, and it has crew three. This card is so hilarious. I love it. It's just a bunch of hamsters. It's not even like like a wheel necessarily like you would think. Like they're literally just clumped together, rolling as one being. It's it is a, a true, literal hamster ball. A, a true ham sphere. Oh, this is so perfect. I don't know how playable this is at seven mana. Um, in a green deck, probably a lot more playable, but... Yeah, it's actually decent with this face commander because the face commander will turn it into a creature without you having without to, you having to crew it. Actually, you know what? The face commander of this deck is actually just a decent gruel vehicles commander if you wanted to go gruel vehicles, which is kind of cool because uh, there are some cool green vehicles. Um, this is, yeah, this card's hilarious. Uh, I, I was wondering, uh, you cannot really build a hamster deck, which is kind of sad because there's only like... Yet. Yeah, yet that is important to say. There's, there's only yeah outside of changelings. I think there's only four. Well, there's only one actual hamster, and then I think there's only four that make hamster tokens. So uh, we're not there yet, but someday we'll get there. And then this will be a great finisher in that deck. And <laughs> uh, it's it's funny enough that I might put it in my vehicle deck, even though it's objectively probably going to be the worst vehicle in my deck. But it's really funny, and it's uh, the art is amazing. Someone make more of fawn hamsters. We yes. gotta, we gotta do it. <laughs> <laughs> technically, technically, that is how more fawn works. If you build it as changelings, technically, it is a hamsters deck. Yeah, yeah. All right, we got two more left in this precon. Uh, next up is thickest in the thicket. Great name. Uh, for three green, green. It's a enchantment. Uh, whenever. Uh, it enters, put X plus one plus one counters on target creature, where X is that creature's power. So you're kind of doubling the power and toughness of that creature. And then at the beginning of your end step, draw two cards if you control uh, the creature with the greatest or tied for the greatest power. Um, that's insane. So it's automatic. So it's going to come down and more or less double the power and toughness of one of your creatures. And then it has the potential of on each of your end steps to draw you two cards. So it's not obviously always going to do that, but if you have a plus one, plus one counter deck, or you have a deck like this where your uh, commander is turning all your big artifacts and enchantments into big honky boys, uh, I feel like this could, could trigger basically always. And I don't think it's going to draw that much hate because people will look at it and say, yeah, it's not always going to trigger, so I'm not going to waste my removal spell on it. So I feel like it's going to actually sit around and draw a decent amount of cards if you are playing a deck like that. Well, if it's working, you have the biggest creature, so that's probably what's getting the hate currently, if anything. Right, right. Here's the thing. Because this card works so perfectly with cards like Doubling Season, um, it's it's just going to come in, do a really incredible thing, and then just sit there un unnoticed like you guys are saying, and nobody's going to want to destroy it. But it's like, this is going to draw every counter spell. So I, I just, you know, for a color that doesn't have a whole lot to do with that, um, I love it. But it's like, man, you kind of just put a target on your back after playing a card that's going to do one really powerful thing and sit there and do such a not so powerful thing. Because like imagine you put 10, t 10 uh, plus one plus one counters on something and now you're only drawing like one card uh, um, at the end of your turn. But everyone at the table is now gunning for you because you just put 10 counters on one creature. And it's like, but it only draws me one card now. Well, it draws two. Yeah. Well, I will say that or, in, sorry, this pre -con, in this precon, this card actually seems pretty decent. But I think in most decks, if you are playing big creatures and green, there are better ways to do it. Like if it's specifically creatures, you just have more efficient cards like Beast Wisp, uh, 
yeah, Beast Whisperer, Beast Whisperer and like Guardian Project. But then if you have like ones that specifically check, like for big creatures, you have like in Gar- uh, in Garok's Wake, I think is the card. It's the enchantment that gives your creatures trample. You get to draw cards when you play big creatures. So uh, I think in a lot of decks you have better options, but I think in this one it's pretty good. All right, uh, Preston, do you want to lead us through the last new card from this deck? Yeah, we have Trail Tracker Scout. One in a green for a 1-3 creature raccoon scout. You can tap him for one man of any color. And whenever you expend eight, return up to one target permanent card from your graveyard to your hand. It's just a good new beefy butt mana uh, dork uh, who has a good secondary ability. Uh, I think this is going to see some play. Mana dorks have kind of fallen off in the past couple years, but... This is one I think is actually going to be somewhat playable, at least in a couple decks. I think that you're not giving this card enough credit. I think that this is already an immediate auto-include in in, 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 in in almost any green deck, I feel like. Because here's the thing. Now, here, the problem with Mana Dorks has always been they help you out in the early game, but then now they're just a creature that just can get destroyed, and it's like, yeah, they're adding mana... But it's like it's a creature, so it's it's just out and there. And late game and green, you probably already had enough mana. Exactly. So if you have this now, now this is actually doing something for you in the late game that is going to matter. And, and, and so I just think because of that alone, um, it, it has a spot into a lot of green decks. But then it taps for one mana of any color. So now it goes into basically any deck that cares about having like mana dorks like this. This is an auto included to so many decks. I, I think that this card is really, really incredible. I was kind of down on this card at first, but I was thinking then, like, assuming you're playing any kind of big mana deck, expend eight is just going to happen all the time, and you will be able to pull back whatever scary thing your opponents are trying to keep you from having. It goes up in value if you have cards that are intent, like if you put something scary into your graveyard intentionally, whether through looting or rummaging or mill or whatever you know yeah so i mean uh actually i i was kind of low on this at first but now i'm like ooh, it's kind of scary so it'll be interesting to see if it if it makes the cuts in any of my decks the fact that it is a like like jason has said uh, on a couple other times that we've talked about mana dorks the fact that it is a mana dork that still does something useful when it gets top decked later in the game is relevant and it enters it's a one three that's a decent blocker all right uh we are moving on to the second pre-con uh this one is called family matters uh jason do you want to go ahead and read the face commander for the viewers yes so this is zinnia valley's voice um it's jeskai so it's one blue one red one white legendary creature bird bard so one three with flying, and it says, uh, "Zinnia Valley's voice gets plus X plus O, where X is the number of other creatures you control with base power one." And then it says, "Creature spells you cast have offspring two. And as we previously talked about, offspring you pay an additional cost when you cast it. You get to make uh, a, a token. So this you pay two whenever you cast a spell, two extra. You can make a one one token that's a copy of it. Um, man." Wouldn't it be nice if you paid thirteen mana and got a blight? You got two blight steals. One of them's a one one, <laughs> sure. One of them's a one one, sure. Well, who cares? But who cares? <laughs> you have two blight steals. Yeah. Um. So, so quick rules thing. I believe if you look at the ninety nine of this deck, there's a lot of uh cards with offspring already on them. I believe offspring stacks. So. If a card has offspring on it and you have Zinnia, you can pay both offsprings and you will get multiple of the one ones. I believe that's how that works. So that's something to keep in mind. Uh, but I like that this is open ended. Like you can kind of go tall, like kind of Voltron by just playing a lot of one ones. You can play like Secure the Waste and stuff like that to get a ton of one ones all at once uh, and commander damage people out. 
you can do like panharmonic y kind of stuff, you know, like enter the battlefield, get a lot of dirtily stuff, just play a lot of small creatures for value. That's how I would personally do it because that sounds fun and like it will drive Preston crazy when I never end the game. Uh, so I, <laughs> I, I like that it's a little open ended. Like there's a couple different directions you can take, and it's going to let you play with all the really cute offspring cards. I don't know what you're going to do with like the cards that are in your deck that don't already have offspring and they don't have the cute little offspring token, uh, but. That's when you yeah. just get an infinite token and you draw like you like draw a baby what, version of it. What you think it would be with just like big old baby. Yeah, yeah. I baby I Emercruel, it. let's go. It's a stork. It's a stork that brings babies. It's it's awesome. Wait, 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 wait. I just thought about okay. this. I just thought about this. The perfect card for this. Generous gift. <laughs> yeah. The the stork is gifting an elephant. Yeah. Yeah. This uh, is going to be one of those commanders that can really abuse the no legendary rule cards. Mm, Start making that's true, yeah, token copies you of could, all your legendary yeah. creatures. That's true. There are a few cards that make you uh, have to not play with the legendary rule, so that would be kind of fun. Yeah, does that work with... Um... So you do have to keep in mind that Offspring is a cast thing. You have to do it on cast. So it doesn't work with Helm of the Host. But there are other ones, like there's like Mirror Box, right? And cards like that. I think it's called Mirror Box. So, yeah, there's ways to do that. All right, and then the Backup Commander. This was a card that uh, Jason was pretty excited about. This is Arthur Marigold Knight for two blue, red, white. It's a legendary 4-5 Mouse Knight with haste. And whenever it and at least one other creature attacks, look at the top six cards of your library. You may put a creature card from among them onto the battlefield, tapped and attacking. Put the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. Return that creature to its owner's hand at end of combat. This seems like, uh, oh, wow, I can't think of what it's called. The really busted uh, Boros Commander from Akoria. What's that one called? Winota. It's like fair Winota, kind of. Uh, like you're, you're cheating in creatures smack in face you have to there's some restrictions but not really i feel like you could do like just busted things with this yeah this was um <clears throat> before that i had learned that we were going to do a whole separate episode just for the commander cards this was going to be in my top three for the set because i love this card so much i want to build a deck around this um I love looking at the top card of my library, obviously, and being able to stack it with really good creatures that I could then throw onto the battlefield, tap and attacking. I and and then it goes and then it goes. It, it the thing is, it doesn't go to my graveyard. It doesn't go back to the top of my library. It doesn't go to the bottom of my library. It goes to my hand, so now I can cast it. Oh my gosh, it's drawing me cards now without drawing me cards. I love this card. It's so cool. I cannot wait to build a deck around this. It's good with big, beefy hitting creatures. It's good with creatures with good ETBs. Uh, it's a cute mouse knight riding. I don't know exactly what it's supposed to be, but he's cool. It, yeah, this is just a cool commander. I I freaking love this commander. This is uh yeah, this is up there for me. Uh, because I feel like what you do is you just like you have to play a lot of creatures, right? Because look at the top six is pretty good, but you do still have a a, a chance of whiffing so you have to play a lot of creatures just play a lot of your favorite creatures just play some really scary creatures that like on turn five or whatever you know you play a creature on so assuming you don't have any ramp you get a, another creature by turn four you play this on turn five so that way it has haste so it can attack and then you attack with the one other at least one other creature and then you trigger it right away you're gonna be doing some scary crap so I'm I'm excited I'm excited I, I want to see someone build this if 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 uh, no one else builds it I'm gonna probably build it it's I it's cool. definitely didn't just go on a rant about how I want to build this I I hope you do uh Preston what's the first uh, 99 card for this all right first up we have Agate Instigator uh it's a one in a red it's one in a red for a one three creature lizard rogue with offspring one red uh when it Whenever another creature you control enters, this creature deals one damage to each opponent. This is going to be so gross so fast. <laughs> oh, it's going to see its token because it'll come in first and then the token gets made. So that's already one damage on cast. And then every single other creature you play is going to do two. 
there's just going to be so many decks that make this so gross. No, that's that's two damage on cast because the token will count the original. No, the to- the original comes in first and then you make the token copy. They don't come in at the same time. That is one thing to keep in track of with Offspring. You do put the main creature out first and then you make the token. Oh, uh, I do so, read that the reminder text now. So, yeah, this is... Uh... Awesome. I think if you're playing a red creature deck, you need a good reason to not play this. So if you are playing Impact Tremors or War Leader's Call or Perforos God of the Forge, if you're playing any of those, this also needs to go in there, I think, because it's going to be just as good, if not better, than all of those cards. Uh, yeah, it's kind of scary. It's got Interestingly it's, enough, it also, has, it also has a relevant creature type in Rogue. Yeah, a red is a, a weird color for that to matter, but it very well could, for sure. Uh, Jason. It does not need to have three toughness. No, it doesn't. I have to waste my lightning bolt on it. Can't thank God it. Thank God the token doesn't. Yeah. Uh, Jason, why don't you talk to us about the next one? Yeah, so this is Calamity of Cinders. It's five and two red, but it has Convoke. And it says, Calamity of Cinders deals six damage to each untapped creature. A really interesting red board wipe. Uh, you, I'm trying to think of the best spot to play this because I imagine well, it's okay. that... It's okay in this <clears throat> deck, right? Because you, with your offspring stuff, you're kind of going wide. Oh, there's also the literal Convoke pre-con from, uh, I think, last year <clears throat> from March of the Machine. Time blurs together. But, you know, like there are cards that have payoffs for Convoke. Uh, and then, yeah, go wide decks. You're going to be able to keep a good chunk of your board. Yeah, but I mean, I, 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 I mean, I don't mean necessarily what decks it goes in. I meant what time in the game because I'm thinking about, like, this is often play group specific uh but if you're playing in groups that everybody's attacking you know how much is this really going to do um tapping your creatures down to protect them from this is is really really nice so i think that it is it is a powerful board wipe uh because it allows you more control than a typical red spell might but i just i think it's incredibly situational yeah it is I also don't really only like six it. damage I, I don't think it does enough damage with how easy it is for your opponents to not get hit by it. Yeah. Like, if it dealt damage equal to the number of tapped creatures you control, slam dunk card. But only dealing six, and it's very easy to get around it. And it's I only to, un- it's only to uh, untapped creatures, too. So if your opponents are attacking, yeah. then yeah. That is something more if they have any the cap abilities. Though. Art is pretty good. Yeah, sun, I, I'm pretty sure that Sunspine links on the art, and we uh, check out last week's episode if if you want to hear us talk about Sunspine links. Uh, all right, so here's the next card. This is Echoing Assault, which is for four and a red enchantment. Creature tokens you control have menace. Nice. And then whenever you attack a player, choose target non-token creature that's attacking that player. Create a token that's a copy of that creature, except it's a one-one, so you're kind of offspringing it. And then that token enters tapped and attacking that player. Sacrifice it at the beginning of the next end step. Uh, that's pretty scary. Uh, that works really well with anything that has like damage triggers. Because I, I mean, giving the giving the menace seems pretty important. Like I feel like you're gonna be able to get in a lot more easily. Like yeah, it's only a one one, but I don't know. It's the menace on top of being able to make. So you don't get attack triggers, right? Because when you get created, uh, it's already tapped and attacking, right? When you create the token. So so it, it wouldn't work there, but you would get any cool enter the battlefield triggers again. Uh, you would get any damage triggers, assuming it, it, it hits. I feel like there's cool things you can do with it. See, this card is amazing to me because, first of all, I just it's it's goblin war drums and then for two extra mana you just get to do something incredible like news for the fans out there that might know I have this deck uh, I am taking apart Obeka it's no longer going to be a thing 
If I do decide to rebuild that deck, which probably, because that deck was a lot of fun, I'll probably rebuild it at some point. This is 100% going to go in there because it's such a fun thing to do. It's that sacrifice at the beginning of the next end step. Anytime a card says that, I just always jump to, well, if I end the turn, then I don't have to do that. And getting around the way cards work, like getting around the rules of cards, is arguably the most powerful thing that you can do. Also, if, if it's paired with green or white, you get to double those tokens, and you don't have to sacrifice the d doubled tokens. That's always a fun thing. So, it's a pretty yeah, it's good probably, card. It's probably good that the uh, Offspring deck uh, doesn't have green in it, because then, like, the first thing you slot in here is doubling season, parallel lives, stuff like that. So, that's probably for the best. All right, uh, we have a couple more cards in this pre-con. Preston, what's the next one? All right, next up, Fortune Teller's Talent. For one blue, it's an enchantment class. Uh, the first part is you may look at the top card of your library at any time. Oh, then stop. level two, <laughs> if you pay another three and a blue, as long as you cast a spell this turn, you may play card from the top of your library. Uh, and then finally, at level three, for two and a blue, spells you cast anywhere from anywhere other than your hand cost two less to cast. This is such a good card. <laughs> oh, this Jason's is going to be gross Jason's in so many decks. Just, like, this would have joy. absolutely been like my number one card if we were do if we were not doing commander like cards from the set. Oh my gosh, I love this. This might as well have just said Jason's favorite card. Like that's what the <laughs> that's what the name of this card could have been. It would have been the same card. Jason oh would play God. it even if he never leveled it up. Jason would play it just for the 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 one mana static level one ability. Jason would cheat and put this in car in decks with no blue. This has got to be one of the best versions of this effect, though, right? Like you have to you have to pump a lot of mana into it to level it up to the different modes. But I think if you like a lot of the other ones that let you do these kind of things, they they have. Uh, they're they're usually more color restrictive or they're restrictive in what they can play. Uh, so this seems like one of the best ones, minus the fact they have to pump a lot of mana into it. But this this is good. Here's the other thing, though. You think about it, it's kind of ramp for blue because it says play cards from the top of your library, not cast spells. So, uh, well, it says, it's, uh, yeah, it says you may play cards from the top of your library as long as you've cast a spell this turn. So you could play lands from the top of your library. And, I mean, if you're in blue, you probably are able to manipulate the top of your library one way or the other with, you know, potential scrying. Um, I think that this card is really good. And, and and only having to pay five mana to do that. And just think about this, fellas. Think about how often you're going to hear me say, uh, all right, turn one, play an island, tap, fortune teller's talent. Look at the top card of my library. Pass the turn. Yeah, I feel like we're yeah. gonna. I feel like we're gonna see that one a lot. Yeah, the fact that it's only one to start off, and you already get to start looking, is pretty gross. Yeah, and, and even though it doesn't like let you do anything with that card, top card, it does let you start playing ahead, which I I like as well. Just because commander games tend to drag on, so you know anything that lets you think think your your turns out a little bit before you have to actually start doing it is is nice as well. Uh, Jason, what's the next card? So the next card is Murmuration. Uh, for four to white, it's an enchantment that says birds you control get plus one plus one and have vigilance. And at the beginning of your at the beginning of your end step, for each spell you've cast this turn, create a one two blue bird creature token with flying named Stormcrow. Shout out Stormcrow! It, it, it wasn't that an uncard. It was wasn't that an uncard? That it's like a it's it was like a a, a, a Stormcrow that literally had storm. So this isn't this pretty good. Like if you are like uh, I I think you probably play it in if you have a bird deck you probably just play it. But if you are playing any kind of like spell slinger stormy kind of deck, this seems insane. It's going to put so many bodies on the board. Also, you I I would put this into any creature deck that also runs mirror entity. Uh, because I mean you're in white. So you're probably able to search these enchantments up to the battlefield, or at least to your hand. 
So if you have one, you can go find the other probably. And then depending on what other colors you're splashing in there, plus white has plenty of card draw, so it's very it's very likely that throughout the game you're just going to draw into it. Um, so I think that it, I think if you run mirror entity, you also run this card. I guess the only uh, hit against this is if you're if you want to play it the the best way, which I think is the storm plan. That's typically an is a thing. Um, you definitely can go Jeskai with it. Uh, there's like Narset, you know. There are Jeskai options if you want to storm off, but uh, that's something to keep in mind. It's also five mana, but it's pretty good. I think it's if you find a spot in your game where you can drop this sucker, I feel like this is a game winner in those decks. I'm not sure how I feel about it. I can see it doing a lot, but I can also see it being a dead card a lot of the times. But I, it it is funny. You only play this in, you only play this in decks that want it. You you don't play this in 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 like every white deck. But I think that if you're running a white deck that runs Mirror Entity, I feel like that's probably part of your game plan. So, but that's the only reason I said that. All right, uh, we got two more left in this deck. This is Polywog Prodigy uh, for one and a blue. It's a frog wizard, hell yeah. With uh, It's a 1-3 with Evolve. Uh, so whenever a creature you control enters, if that creature has greater power or toughness than this creature, you put a 1-1 counter on this creature. And then whenever an opponent casts a non-creature spell with mana value less than uh, Prodigy's uh, power, draw a card. So... It's a two-mana 1-3 that's going to grow over time, and it's probably going to draw you a few cards along the way. This seems like the blue... Like, Esper Sentinel? But you don't just jam this in every blue deck like you jam Esper Sentinel into every white deck? I don't know. It seems okay. Seems all right. It's a little weird it's in a Jeskai deck because this is clearly such a Simic card. But when you do find a deck where there's belongs, it's going to get pretty gross pretty fast. Yeah, this is another card that wasn't necessarily printed for this deck. It was just printed for Commander. Um, it's probably one of the cards that you cut for something better. But it's, you know, I, I, I can understand why some people think of this as a new staple kind of card. But I don't think that it's that powerful. I, I, I think that, you know, you're going to draw a card maybe from it so like some of the time most of the time you'll draw a card you might draw i it's i don't know it's just it's it's hard for me to see how really 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 good this card is you're gonna need to play big creatures fast to make this card work well so it's it starts off as a one it's it starts off as a one three as well so most creatures are just going to check for the evolve and assuming you are yeah, anything creature oriented, you have ways to scale up as well. Yeah, creature deck for sure. Like, like, good, it definitely should go into creature decks. Um, that are so. Like- I haven't been paying very close attention, but I think as we're going through this, this is the most expensive card that we've talked about on secondary market. Uh, we are. It is important to keep in mind that we are still uh, at the time of recording this, still in pre-order pricing. But I, I think that means that people are looking at this as if it's staple level. Yeah, I, I think people are going to, this is going to be one of those cards they have to realize is good in some decks, but not going to be a staple at all. Maybe it's a CDH staple. It's a two mana Maybe? body that's going to draw you an insane amount of cards. Because it's not like Esper Sentinel where you can pay to keep them from drawing, or Ristic Study where you can pay to keep them right. from drawing. You just will draw. That's probably and where it, it goes. I guess so, yeah. I, I don't know CD super well, but I can see that being a thing. I'm just trying to understand why this is a $15 card. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, Preston, talk to us about the last card from this pre-con. All right. Finally, we have Rapid Augmenter. Uh, one blue and a red for a 1-3 creature art- artificer. Bit of a mouthful. Haste, whenever another creature you control with base power 1 enters, it gains haste until end of turn. 
And whenever another creature you control enters, if it wasn't cast, you put a plus one, plus one counter on Rapid Augmenter. And Rapid Augmenter can't be blocked this turn. Uh, this is a pretty good little 1-1 one, one token deck beater. You know, he gets big pretty quickly with those. You get to give all your little guys haste. Uh, Red-blue is a bit of a weird color combination for that, but I, it can absolutely put in some work, I think. Yeah, in this deck, sweet, because it works with the Offspring, right? It's pretty sweet in this deck, but outside of it, it does seem a little awkward. Just because is it is kind of awkward for tokens. Now, if you go into Jeskai, right? If you go into Jeskai and then you start talking like... Kaikar? Uh, yeah, like those kind of decks or a lot of the spell slingery win cons are tokens based. So well, may maybe I, it has more home. It actually thinking, has but... quite a few tokens. It just doesn't have a lot of 1-1 one -one tokens when you're playing Is It decks, I feel like. Normally they're like 2-2s two or 3-3s. Three I feel like there's not a ton... Or you do have a young pyromancer at least, so you know there there are op. It's, there's definitely a couple options I can see. Us in decks where you can make it work is going to do great work. It's just going to be a little more limited than some of the other cards. They I had. Think I like that. I think I like that. I think I like that. It's it's very good, but it's not going to go in every deck of the archetype. So I actually they like that. They had to make this red blue so that it wasn't just red and went into every goblin deck that exists. That's a good point. That would be kind of insane. All right. Uh, we are moving on to precon numero three. This one's called Peace Offering. And uh, whose turn is it to read, Jason? Uh, Jason, what is the, uh, what's the face commander of this one? This is Miss Bumbleflower. It's one, a green, a white, and a blue. For a legendary creature, Rabbit Citizen, it's a 1-5 with Vigilance. This is whenever you cast a spell, target opponent draws a card. Put a plus one, plus one counter on target creature. It gains flying until end of turn. If this is the second time this ability is resolved this turn, draw you draw two cards. Holy guacamole, Batman. This card's so, doing uh... a whole bunch of stuff for four mana. Spoiler alert! This is what I'm. This is what I'm. I'm playing on the Bloomboro episode of our Commander Gameplay series. I'm so excited! I finalized my deck list. I got it put together. I'm super excited. I'm gonna play it tomorrow at at uh when we get together to play games. I'm super excited. Uh, it's a lot though. Like guys, that's a lot of words. That's so. Every time you cast a spell, you have to check all that. That's a lot. That kind of sounds nightmarish, but um, it's adorable. And it's group huggy, so I'm here for it. It's also an interesting color combination that you could actually like kind of build a storm deck around. That's kind of funny, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> then you just Voltron people out because you could just like put the one one counters on your own creatures. It doesn't say you have to put them on it. Like it is like group huggy. Like the idea is that you could put the counters on other people's creatures, but like uh, that's kind of funny yeah because i mean you just you just play a whole bunch of low-cost spells that are gonna trigger this ability a bunch of times and then you play your storm cards and just win in one of the two ways that you now have with either all the big creatures that you just did or from one of your <laughs> your storm spells that is kind of funny but yeah i'm just excited to play some group hug sorry uh I didn't pay attention to anything you guys said for the past minutes. Uh, why is the alternate art version of this card selling for 160? Because they're super rare. Uh, well, keep in mind we are in pre-order pricing, uh, but it's uh, they're raised foils. Um, they're raised textured foils. Um, they're only in collector boosters, and they are uh, very very low hit rate. Okay. Sorry, that just shocked me to my core. I, I needed a second to recalibrate. <laughs> Morgan, did well, you just issue a challenge with the low hit rate? Do I have to go buy? Yeah, now you have to go buy Bloomboro uh, collector boosters. There you go. He'll find it in his first three packs. I'm guaranteeing it, uh, and then he'll give it to me as a as a birthday gift or something because I love this card so much. Uh, so uh, the backup commander is Mr. Foxglove for two green, white, blue. It's a 3-5 Fox Rogue with lifelink. 
when it attacks, draw cards equal to the number of cards in defending player's hand minus the number of cards in your hand. Uh, so if you there's a differential in the cards, you draw equal to the difference. And then if you didn't draw cards this way, you may put a creature card from your hand onto the battlefield. So uh, the way that it's supposed to work in the group hug deck is that you're supposed to, like, with the face commander, you're drawing other people cards. And then you come in with this, and you're like, okay, well, I'm going to catch back up with the card draw. But the degenerate thing to do is you just draw a bunch of cards yourself, and then you attack people who have less cards than you, and you just uh, drop giant, terrifying Eldrazi's and disgusting crap, which is hilarious. Ugh. <laughs> Why are the backup commanders in this set so insane? <laughs> I feel like every, all three of them every we've commander about. of this set is good. They're all buildable, but it's gross. Yeah, this is this is like not group hug at all. Uh, this is like I'm going to lose my friends because you're also you're also in the ramp colors, so. It's a five mana commander, but it's almost certainly coming down before then. And it, the one downside is it doesn't have haste. So, and it has to attack in order to get that uh, ability. But there's a good chance that you you get it once or twice and you're probably going to win. You might not be able to do it the first turn you play him, but you are playing the three protection colors. So, uh, yeah, he's probably going to stick around in order to attack. There's also no reason you can't play like Lightning Greaves or Swift Foot Boots or whatever. He's also a five mana, so it's not like he's... I mean, he had definitely, with green in the mix, he definitely has the potential to come out early, but yeah. five mana, it's it's not going to exactly be turn two that you play this guy. Well, right. It's probably, it's probably turn four that he comes down, right? You either, like, cultivate on turn three or you rainbow growth on turn two or something like that. Maybe you, have, maybe you play Signet. rocks. Like, yeah, yeah, maybe you play rocks. Or maybe you played a Mystic or more and you drew into some lands... And you drew into your ramp spells. Like your temple of the false god. All right. Uh, Pre Preston, what's the next card? All right. So this is our first non-legendary creature back or commander of, of this precon. Uh, it's Bloodroot Apothecary. Two and a green for a 3-3 three, three creature scroll druid with Toxic 2. Whenever Bloodroot Apothecary enters, you and each target opponent each create a treasure token, and whenever an opponent sacrifices a non-creature token, that player gets two poison counters. This is the card of the set for Commander. This is going to be a staple. It makes it so treasure decks are actually somewhat manageable. There's a few other uh, sort of... Things you're going to hit by accident, but obviously this is to try to stop the treasure players. That is why this card exists. Yeah. I don't know why this is not in the squirrel deck. That because is strange. The, the last precon is literally a squirrel deck, and this uh, would probably be good in there. Uh, I think the idea is that you're giving your opponents things, so obviously that's group hug, but like... This is so not a group hug card. And in fact, that's actually my biggest critique. I'm going to get this out of the way now. Uh, my biggest critique of this precon is it's actually not group hug because why would I play win cons on my group hug deck? That sounds ridiculous. Uh, <laughs> but uh, no, this is great. This is great hate against treasure treasure decks. There are so many, pro even if you're not playing a treasure deck, there are cards that make such absurd amounts of treasures that it would be nice to have something in your deck that can keep them at bay. So, and you're not saying you can't use your treasure. You're just saying if you're, if you do, you're putting yourself in a much easier position to be killed. So you also got to, you also got to keep in mind that, you know, they're building these decks not to remain as they are. They're building them, you know, to give commander players good pieces for other decks and also a good base for a new kind of deck to build. Um, but this card is, I'm, a, I'm putting this at Finn for sure, but this card is incredible. Uh, for three mana, it's providing you with so much value. Three mana, three, three with Toxic 2. That alone is decent. That's decent. Um, 
and now you're just like you're making treasure tokens and your opponents are getting poison counters when they're using the treasure tokens that you give them like that feels like a black card to me kind of it, it, it's very weird like I, I don't know i get i get weird color pie mix vibes from i think it's because some, it hates some of these on, i think it's some it of these on, cards on uh uh artifacts and that's what makes it green and it's a squirrel and that's what makes it green i guess i guess that's fair and green has a lot of poison counter stuff. Yeah, yeah. I think green is yeah, actually yeah, yeah. the poison I mean, that's, counter color. That's what I'm yeah. saying. Like it's going in Finn for sure. Um, but it's I just, like, actually kind of wish it's... it didn't have the toxic too. I feel like that's going to draw a lot of hate from people who aren't playing artifact decks. When the main reason you want this guy is to stop those kind of decks. So I kind of wish it didn't have that. I think it would actually make the card better, even though it would technically be weaker on the surface. I think I could, that there's a, I could see a that lot. Argument. I think there's a lot of reasons you play this card, though. It makes you treasure tokens for one. But you're playing it to stop other people's treasure decks. That, that third line of text is the thing that people are going to play this for. It has some other uses, but that's why it's going to get played. That's fair. All right, Jason, what's next? So next we have Communal Brewing. It's uh, an enchantment for two and a green. It says when Communal Brewing enters, any number of target opponents each draw a card. Put an ingredient counter on Communal Brewing, then put an ingredient counter on it for each card drawn this turn. Whenever you cast a creature spell, that creature enters with X additional plus one plus one counters on it, where X is the number of ingredients counters on Communal Brewing. That is a lot of words, gentlemen. But, oh my goodness, when you sit there and you see what all these words mean, you're like, this is an incredible three-mana enchantment. This is so, so good. It's going to fit into a ton of decks. This card is great. This is insane. I, I love that you get to pick <laughs> which opponents do it. Because so many of these cards are like, they can choose if they want to do it. You get to pick, and that makes it a thousand times better than those other cards. You can prevent the, the the player who's in the lead from drawing another card and just give everyone else a, a card to, like, potentially stop them. That feels very group huggy to me. Well, assuming you're in a position where you're not, where there's not already an arch enemy at the table, like if this is, like, after a, a board wipe has kind of even the playing field or if you get this down early game, you probably can just full send this. Like, you could just say, okay, all of my opponents each get to draw a card, but as a result, for the rest of the game, assuming no one answers this thing, all of my creatures are coming in with an additional plus three, plus three. That's insane. So I think just on on that alone, like, yeah, you're giving each of your opponents one extra card. Like, you obviously would tend to not want to do that. It's not like you're in a wheel deck because you're playing green, uh, but... Uh, your creatures are going to be huge. Well, you get to put one on even if you don't choose any opponents. Right, right, right. It, it's either one through four. And because you're playing green, you can put counters on this from other sources. You can double the counters mm, you put true. on it when you first do it. There's probably 18 different proliferate in green alone. So you can literally choose to never give your opponents cards and still put, like, five additional counters on all your creatures with this thing it's so good and this is one of those cards where the more opponents you have the better this card actually becomes yeah it's it's better early game when you all of your opponents are still alive even if you might not want to have all of them draw the card but you, it you being don't even have to play this in a counter deck and it can still be good yeah i think you could just play it in any like deck with a decent amount of creatures and probably get enough value out of it that's worth it it being three mana really allows for that. Yeah. All right, next up is Fisher's Talent. This is another class. God, there's so many words. <laughs> uh, for two, green, blue, uh, level one. At the beginning of your upkeep, look at the top card of your library, Jason, and then you may reveal it if it's a land uh, and create... Oh, wait. And then create a 1-1 one, one fish token if you revealed it that way. Uh, then you draw a card. So... Uh, it's at the beginning of your upkeep. You kind of get to draw an extra card some percentage of the time, and some percentage of the time it's going to give you a token. Uh, that seems no, decent, you draw especially. An extra card. Oh, yeah. So you, you will you always, always draw, draw the it. card. Okay. So you will always draw the card. It's just you will also sometimes also get a token. So it's like a Simic Phyrexian Arena. 
That seems decent. Uh, level two for green and uh, blue to level it up. Uh, if you would create a fish token, create a 3-3 three, three blue shark creature token instead. And then level three for two green blue. If you would create a shark token, create an 8-8 eight, eight, uh, blue octopus creature token instead. So it's kind of fuel for the fire. But I think you really just played... I don't know. I feel like if you have a lot of lands in your deck, couldn't you just play it? Or if you're like Ajax and Nev, right? Like if you're one of those style of decks where you're, you care about tokens, but you're a Simic deck, so you have a lot of lands because you're going to have all your your uh, Simic-y doing Simic things. Wouldn't you just play this for value even if you don't necessarily care to level it up? Because it's only checking for the specific creature types to change but it's going to draw you extra cards and sometimes make you tokens. Yeah, I think you could... You just read this as a four-cost enchantment that always draws you an extra card on your turn, and every once in a while you get to make a creature token. You I don't dis really have to care about the next two. You can, but you don't have to. I disagree slightly because I do think that you should view this as a six mana enchantment that's going to draw you an extra card and make you a three three because for one blue and one green in Simic, that's a pretty easy price to pay. Th that, so that's a good upgrade for two. I so think that you should look at this. Is... I think you should look at this as a six mana enchantment that's going to draw you an extra card and make you a three three. My only rebuttal to that would be that. Uh, while you are in Simic and you probably have the mana to spend, that is a ton of mana to dump into this enchantment if it's just going to get removed or you're not going to make it because you do have to level up classes at sorcery speed. You can't like Seedborn Muse or leave up your mana and be like, okay, well, now I'm going to level up. Like you, you actually have to use that mana and then you don't make these tokens until your upkeep. So unless you literally have nothing else to do, I don't think leveling up is really worth it because you have to uh, do it at sorcery speed. But that's what I'm saying. You should view this but as I think a six mana enchantment because you would want to pay four mana and then pay two mana into it. That way, if somebody destroys it on their rotation and it doesn't even get back to you, at least you tried to get a three, three out of it instead of just holding back. That's, that's just the way that I look at it. Yeah. I just think that the level one is, is good enough that I would play this in decks that cared about tokens. It seems really good. I'm here for it. All right. Uh, Preston, what's next? Our, this card's kind of funny. Uh, this is Jacked Rabbit for X, one, and white. It's a one, two creature, Rabbit Warrior with Ravenous. This creature enters with X plus one, plus one counters on it. If X is five or more, you draw a card when it enters. And then when he attacks, you create a number of 1-1 one, one white rabbit creature tokens equal to its power. This is just a fun, silly card. I like the dumb name. It's strong, but not, like, oppressively so. Uh, you know, it can replace itself if you have enough mana. This this is just funny. I like it. Not oppressively strong. He's jacked, dude. What do you mean, bro? Look at him. He's freaking jacked, dude. But he only does chest day. His arms are kind of thin for how big his chest is. <laughs> you right. You right. And look how small yeah. his head is. Bro needs to hit the library. <laughs> <laughs> Flex that muscle. Uh, I, I really like this card. It, it snowballs, but it's just making a bunch of one ones, which is flavorful for rabbits. Um, Just they go wide, baby. I, uh, I, I, I like this card for seven, I, man. I like this card. I, I, like I like this card a lot. I like this card if you play it for seven mana and um, you get five plus one plus one counters on it and you draw a card and now you're making uh, six tokens. And it's it's, fu it's fun. I, I, you, you nailed it, Preston. It's a fun, silly card. Yeah. Yeah, nothing nothing super uh, impressive, but it, it definitely is going to have plenty of homes. Plenty of homes. All right, uh, Jason, what's next? So next up, we got Steel Bird Champion. For two and a white, it's a Mouse Soldier 1-1 one, one with Offspring for one and a white. It has Vigilance, and it says whenever an opponent casts a non-creature spell, put a plus one, plus one counter on this creature. Um, I don't know if I would call this a staple, but I definitely think that this card is going to see play in a lot of decks. Um, a 1-1 one, one with Vigilance isn't, isn't that impressive. Um, 
and you really are relying on your opponents to not necessarily be playing a lot of creatures. Uh, but I think that this card is going to see play in a lot of decks. Um, paying well, five so there, mana there are cards to get that, that there ability are cards twice. That do this. Like there's the red uh, changeling that puts a counter on it whenever an opponent plays a uh, cast a spell. There's that hydra that does the same thing. This does only check non creatures, which is the one thing I'm worried about because the casual yeah. side of commander tends to be more lenient on creatures. But I I feel like it's probably good though. I don't know. That that was my only point for like five mana to be doing that because I, I if you're gonna play this for three mana and only get the one, it's fine. But ideally, you would probably want to be casting it for five and get a token copy of it. You know at at that late in the game, like how many non-creature spells are people casting? Cause you know, now they've probably got a decent amount of mana on the board. They're probably playing their commander or playing other creatures, you know, depending on what the strategy is, maybe they're playing some non-creatures, but you know, I, I think this will see play, but I just don't know how good it actually is. You got to have some token doublers or triplers, which wife has luckily to really start popping off with this guy. And it's definitely a uh, play group specific. You want to be kind of high power, but not too high power. I think is where he's going to be good. Like that. It might also just range. be good enough if you're a plus one plus one counter deck in general, because assuming you can just get a counter on it to get the ball rolling, because you know it it just will happen. Like your opponent doesn't have any way to stop it from happening, minus just not playing their non creatures. So I think if you can just get like a counter on and get the ball rolling, it, it might be worth playing in uh, counter decks as well. Uh, so we actually skipped a couple cards. So I'm going to back up a little bit. Uh, we had these in in uh, alphabetical order. So uh, this is Octomancer. Uh, this is for three green and a blue. It's a frog druid, 3-3, three, three, with gift an octopus. So uh, you may promise an opponent a gift as you cast the spell. If you do, when it enters, they get an 8-8 eight, eight octopus creature token. And then at the beginning of each end step, create a token. That's a copy of target uh, creature token, that entered this turn. Uh, this is very specific. I think the idea is that you just feed into, I'm going to get an 8-8 because I gave an 8-8 to my opponents. But otherwise, uh, unless you have a bunch of creature or uh, token. Yeah, it has to be creature tokens, right? Unless that's something that you go up against in your play group. I don't think this is worth it. It's five well, mana so and hella clunky. Well, if it was only on your turn you do this, it'd be bad. But it's every end step, so you just need to have ways to make token creatures on other people's turns. As long as you can have that happen, it's good. It's worth doing, but... Yeah, giving someone an 8-8 for free is a little risky. That's super sus. <laughs> I like the option, though. Like, if there's, like, an arch enemy at the table, you're like, Hey, you, other player who's behind with me, let's, let's get them. I'll give you an 8-8, you know? So there are times where you would do it but it is scary yeah for five mana i don't like this card that much it's all right i yeah I, yeah also my bad i didn't realize i skipped i scrolled down on the google doc too far that's okay that's okay uh preston what's next all right next up we have perch protection for four and two white it's an instant a uh, gift an extra turn so this better be a pretty good spell if it's giving someone an extra turn uh, you make four 2-2 two, two blue bird creature tokens with flying. If the gift was promised, all permanents you control phase out until your next turn. Your life total can't change and you gain protection from everything. Exile perch protection. Yeah, so we can have a second to fairies protection. I think that's fine. <laughs> it's so awesome. <laughs> so it, so it's twice so it's twice the mana as as uh to fairies protection, right? But if you're if you're gifting the extra turn, what what you're hoping is that you you just have your opponent who you gave the extra turn just finish off your other opponents and then you just have to worry about the one person, right? I think that's the idea. I I think that's when you would when you would crack this up. You you wait till the person you're gifting the extra turn to has the board state to kill one of if not both of the other opponents so that when you come back, you only have one player left to deal with. I think is the idea. I will say eight power in the air. Yeah. Yeah. So you'll, you'll have a good start, you know, in addition to whatever else you got going on. 
so this card is definitely good, and I'm not saying that it's bad. I just don't know that I'm going to play it very often myself because I think about it like uh, Teferi's Protection is more powerful in this scenario when it's 1v1. When when you, the other two players are dead and it's down to the you and just the last player, it, it, casting Teferi's Protection to save yourself and then like being able to surprise them and then go on your turn and either swing in and, and do what you want to do or they're tapped out so you can cast all your spells and you don't have to worry about getting a counter or anything. That's one of the best parts about Teferi's Protection. With this, now you're giving that player an extra turn so they see it happen and then they're like, okay, I'm going to have another turn to set up and prepare for them coming back from the phase out. Uh, so that's, you know, you are making the four tokens, uh, which is you know, a huge bonus from the Teferi's Protection. But I just think giving an extra turn is too powerful to make this card as good as it reads. This is also, uh, it's really easy to leave up the three mana for Teferi's Protection. It's much more difficult to leave up six mana for this. If you leave up six mana, they're probably going to expect something like this to happen. Yeah, th something's happening, yeah. They I might be expecting like card, a board wipe, though, it's... instead of this. All right, uh, Jason, what do we got next? Next, we have Tempt with Bunnies. For two and a white, this is a sorcery. It says, Tempting Offer. Draw a card and create a 1-1 one, one white rabbit creature token. Then, each opponent may draw a card and create a 1-1 one, one white rabbit creature token. For each opponent who does, you draw a card and you create a 1-1 one, one white rabbit creature token. I like saying 1-1 one, one white rabbit creature token. It's just fun to say. Try it sometime. Uh, I love this card, and if anyone ever plays this card against me, I will never say no to it. I'll always draw a card and make a rabbit. Uh, give me my give me my bunny son yeah, yeah this is in my this is in my bloomboro deck this is a uh, a freaking amazing card i feel like you could just generically run this in a lot of white decks just as like a card draw slot because well first off it's adorable uh the the bunny tokens are so cute the bunny tokens are so cute and your opponents they're probably down to draw a card and get a body you know so even if this is three mana, get one, 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 and draw a card, and all of your opponents are bums and don't take you up on it, this is still, I think, a better floor than a lot of the other tempt with cards, and I think its ceiling is is up there. Yeah, well, with those other cards, like it's usually smart to say no, but if you say no to that cute little bunny, everyone's <laughs> going to judge you. Yeah. Like, it doesn't matter if it's the smart play. The right play is to get yourself a bunny. Is get this the best card guy. draw? Is this the best card draw sorcery in white? Maybe. I feel like it has that potential. I mean, for commander specifically. So, so I think I think in a lot of decks it's the best one, but I, I think you have to care about the bodies in order for that to be true. Because the the one card that I would say is well, actually, maybe this is the best. Because the one rebuttal I was going to say is, like, maybe in some situations, Secret Rendezvous is better. But the ceiling of this is still better than Secret Rendezvous, so I don't know. Because you draw and a card, you have potential to draw four. Cards. Giving each opponent one card is always going to be better for you than one person getting, what is it, three? Yeah. Well, the yeah, Secret Rendezvous is just one. The, the the one argument against that is sometimes there's one player who's just really, really far behind, so it doesn't hurt as bad to give it to them. Or uh, there's one person who has, like, a way weaker deck than everyone else at the table, or they're playing a strategy that, like, you just don't care. Like, their strategy doesn't affect your strategy, so if they're popping off, it doesn't hurt you at all. So there are situations where Secret Rendezvous might technically be better, but uh, I'd still rather play this because bunnies. All right, uh, and here's the last card from this deck. This is uh, 20 Toad Toad. <sighs> I'm never saying that again. Uh, for three and a blue, it's a 3-3 three, three Frog Wizard. You uh, your maximum hand size is 20. Whenever you attack with two or more creatures, put a plus one, plus one counter on it and draw a card. And then whenever it attacks, you win the game if there are 20 or more uh, counters on it or you have 20 or more cards in hand. This seems like a kind of well i was gonna say it's a hard win con but i think it just reads hard i think once you actually like if you are going to go all in on trying to make this win con happen i think you could actually get there pretty quick i think it would just be a matter of making sure you're in simic so you have your creature tutors to find it yeah winning with the counters probably hard winning with 20 cards in hand in blue not hard 
Uh, that's going to be very easy in a lot of decks that exist. Yeah, this I Simic is the perfect spot for this card. Um, I think that especially because you're in blue, you are going to have the uh, potential to... Um, well, I'm trying to think of how many blue spells will give other things flash. Yeah. I'll move on. Uh, this card's really powerful. I think that it's going to be a fun card to have in a lot of decks. It's, it's, a, it's a cool win con. It's, it, it really is. But it's fair enough to where people can see it coming and respond, so it's not going to be like a bad feeling most of the time. Yeah, if someone has 20 cards in hand, I'm worried about the fact that they have 20 cards in hand. I'm not worried about the stupid frog. You know, like, like I'm going to have to remove it because otherwise they have a chance of winning, right? But my my main concern is going to be like, oh my god, that person has 20 cards in hand. Or they're working their way up to 20 cards. I'm like, yo, chill. So that's the problem. I also think this card might draw a little bit more hate than people might expect because it does say win the game on it. Cards like that usually draw people's attention. Yeah. Got to make sure they don't get too close. All right. We still have one more pre-con to hit. Oh, my God. Uh, Preston, what is the face commander for... Uh, what's the name of this? Squirreled Away. <laughs> what's the face commander of this pre-con? So the face commander is Hazel of the Root Bloom for two, a black and a green. It's a 3-5 legendary creature scroll druid. You hit pay two life, tap X, untap tokens you control, add X mana of any combination of colors. And at the beginning of your end step, you create a token that's a copy of target token you control. If that token is a squirrel, instead create two tokens that are copies of it. This is a good token deck, Commander. This is a fantastic squirrel, Commander. This is going to be very gross very quickly. Making your tokens into mana is one of the oldest and most powerful Commander staple strategies. And this is one of the best ones out there. I like that it works so well with Chatterfang because before Chatterfang was like kind of the only squirrel commander, kind of, and this is like just as good in some ways. Maybe it's better if you want to go specifically squirrels than Chatterfang because Chatterfang, I think, is more like open-ended token and a combo potential and stuff like that. Uh, but this is very, very strong. Well, this is and open-ended too. They work. Yeah, but the, uh, I, I like that they work together. It's cool. This also is just going to be really good to slot into decks that are that care about tokens that are in these colors or have these colors because being able to make copies of tokens that you have is... I mean, especially if you're making tokens that actually matter and not just the regular food or treasure tokens or something like that. Uh, cards are really, really good. Yeah. All right, and Jason, what is the backup commander for this pre-con? Backup commander for this pre-con is the Odd Acorn Gang. It's a legendary creature, Squirrel Warrior. For three, a black and a green. It's a 5-5 five, five with Menace, Trample, and Reach. It says squirrels you control have tap. Target squirrel gets plus two, plus two, and gains trample until end of turn. Activate only as a sorcery. And then it says whatever one or more squirrels you control deal combat damage to a player, draw a card. Uh, it's Tovalar for squirrels. I actually think it's way funnier to go wide, right? And then you tap all your other stupid squirrels and you make this one huge because it's already a 5-5 five, five with Menace Trample Reach and you just start commander damaging people out with a squirrel. That sounds hilarious. Oh my God, it'd be so funny because then you're like, all right, I have uh, 15 and then on the squirrels. Cherry on top, you draw gonna, card. gonna tap these 15 squirrels to give this plus 30, plus 30. So it's a 35, 35. Gonna swing at you, kill you. All right, he's dead. Who's next? Oh, wait a second. Draw a card. Just one card after all of that. That sounds hilarious. If I was to build a squirrel deck, this is what I would use because that sounds so funny. Same. <laughs> also, it's the odd acorn gang. Like, man, that sounds like a that's. I, if I ever have a band, I'm gonna name my band that. <laughs> that's that's a good one. All right. Uh, next up, how do I keep getting the class cards? This is uh, Gorman's Talent uh, for a green, one green mana, class, level one. During your turn, artifacts you control are foods in addition to their other types, uh, which means they have pay two, tap it, sacrifice this artifact, uh, you gain three life. Level two, two and a green. 
Whenever you gain life for the first time each turn, create a 3-3 raccoon creature token. And last one is for three and a green, whenever you gain life uh, for the first time each turn, put a 1-1 counter on each creature you control. Uh, I actually really like this for food decks. I really like this for food decks, but outside of that, I don't, I don't care. It's good for sacrifice theme decks, because like you know, this in um uh like a Corvold deck is gonna be really good because it's gonna keep uh you know your stuff, uh it's it's gonna give you additional value when you're sacrificing your things, uh to it. It's just gonna give you another way to sacrifice stuff so it's, it's a sack outlet in that sense because it's still keeping the other types so you know those creature dying effects that you're gonna have um it's gonna be good there so i think that this card does have some really good value especially because you're able to get that sack outlet for one mana yeah you have to pay two mana into sacrificing each creature but you paid one mana to give all your creatures that ability or your all your artifacts excuse me I feel like you can do some weird things with this in the Academy Manufacturer. Is that the one where if you make a clue, trigger yep. food, you make all of them? Academy so Manufacturer, you, yeah. If you're making stuff that's artifact tri tokens that aren't normally foods, they become foods, so now you get to work with him. I feel like you can do something cool with that, but otherwise, yeah, it's a good food card, but uh, as a life gain player, this isn't my favorite one I've ever seen. But I like it. Yeah. Uh, Preston, what's next? All right. Next, we have Hazel's Brewmaster for three and a black. Creature, Squirrel Warlock, three, four, with Menace. When it enters or attacks, exile up to one target card from a graveyard and create a food token. Foods you control have all activated abilities of all creature cards exiled with Hazel's Brewmaster. That's, that's going to be kind of gross, I feel like. Cause there have really to be so many making... combos with this. Food decks are always good at making a hundred food each turn. Uh, so uh, you really need to protect this for it to be gross. But I mean, it's a three-four with menace. So you've got a good protection already. And it's from a graveyard, so you could put, you could like put combo pieces into your own graveyard on purpose, exile them with the brewmaster. Your foods have those abilities. So like, I think the fair way to do this is that you are doing it to your opponent's stuff because you they have things that you don't want them to get back. But even that is like still very powerful. You are probably gaining some really cool abilities out of that. But the combo potential is really in that you could do it to your own cards in your own graveyard. Yeah, which is I think terrifying. <laughs> I, I think that you may not necessarily need to protect this card as much. Like if you you if you use it um as like a one shot type of thing. Like if you do a whole lot of setup and there's just one creature card in your graveyard that you need like the ability to activate or whatever, um, you use it then, but you could definitely, uh, um, you know, play this in a situation, protect it, exile multiple cards. And now your foods are doing all kinds of crazy things. Uh, this card is really good. The first time that I read it, I was just like, Oh, this is cool. This is fun. Dealing with stuff with food to excuse me. Nah, I'm really scared to see what people do with this. There's got to be so some really degenerate stuff with that. All right. Uh, next up is, I think it's my turn to read, right? Or is it Jason's turn? I think it's my turn. It's my okay, turn. Okay, Jason, Jason, go ahead. Yeah. So next we have Insatiable, insatiable fr Frugivore. The insatiable Frugivore. Uh, it is a Rat Berserker for three and a black. It's a 2-4. And it says, when Insatiable Fergivore enters, create a food token. Then you may exile three cards from your graveyard. If you do, repeat this process. So, oh, so you may exile three cards from your graveyard. So it doesn't give you, like, up to three. Uh, you have to choose three. And then if you do, you do it again. Uh, then you can pay three and a black, sacrifice X foods, Creatures you control get plus X plus O and gain menace until end of turn. I mean, this card is is it's good, but like I don't think it's crazy. You need to have a huge board and a huge amount of foods to really pop off with it. 
and eight mana. So like I can see it doing some work, but it's not like immediately throwing all your food decks right away. Yeah, the activate ability is what makes me think that this card is playable because it could just be a really bad creator hoof in your food decks, right? But that first ability, I don't think sounds worth it because if you're using that, well, I mean, if it comes down and makes one food right away, fine, whatever. Uh, but if you want to repeat it, you're getting rid of your graveyard and you're a black deck you have other means of wanting to utilize your your graveyard. I don't really want to be exiling everything out of my graveyard to repeat the process just to get more food tokens. Well, and you only get to repeat it once. If you could repeat it as many times as you want, sure. that might be better. Also, it's a flavor fail because most of the food tokens you make involve killing a creature, so it's not eating fruit anymore. Flavor fail, Watsy. I can't believe it. Unplayable. Yeah. Yeah, not my favorite. All right, uh, next one is Moonstone Eulogist. This is for three black black. It's a bat warlock with flying. Four, four. Whenever a creature an opponent control dies, you create a blood token. And blood tokens, again, are an artifact token that have pay one, tap it, discard a card, sacrifice it to draw a card. And then whenever you sacrifice an artifact, you put a 1-1 counter on it and gain a life. Uh, this card is... Uh, no, it, it's not that strong, but it's really cool, and there are ways to abuse it. I almost built the bat deck for the Bloomborough episode, and this card kind of makes me second guess on making me think I should have built it because it's really cool. Uh, but blood tokens are, I think people kind of frown upon them. They think that the blood tokens aren't as strong as a lot of the other artifact tokens that we get, but... Uh, you can find ways to utilize them. Like if you are wanting things in your graveyard, you care about discarding, uh, it's it's pretty good. And it's going to get really big. Yeah. I, I, I'm one of those people that doesn't like blood tokens, but he doesn't have to go with blood tokens and still be good. So you can throw me your Prosper deck or whatever, and he'll still get big really fast and gain you a ton of life. So... It's a good card. All right, and then Preston, uh, you want to walk us through the next one? Yeah. Next up, we have Root Cast Apprenticeship. For three and a green, it's a sorcery. Choose three. You may choose the same mode more than once. Put two plus one plus one counters on target creature. Create a token that's a copy of target token you control. Target player creates a one one green scroll of creature token. And target opponent sacrifices a non-token artifact. Uh, if you pick that second one three times, depending on what tokens you have out, that's going to be very gross for four mana. Like, the other modes are all fine too, but that second one is where the power of this card lies, I think. I wish they had formatted this to have the, the paw modes, right? Like, the that, that season of cycle from the main set. That would have been kind of fun. Justify having a whole new thing to keep track yeah, of. Yeah, yeah, that would have been kind of fun, but... Um, this is obviously a lot easier to understand. It's going to be easier to resolve. It's more flexible, but that would have been kind of cool to see. Uh, yeah, I, I, I agree. I think it's, I think it's the second mode that is going to make or break. I think it's fine. Like, I think if you're playing a deck that cares about any of these things, it's perfectly fine. But the second mode is where it, it could get really interesting. For certain things, yeah, you definitely could. Um, uh, if you're making tokens, token copies of your creatures already, and then you just make more to of, of those tokens, um, depending on the creatures that you're copying, that's going to be good. But, I mean, you could also just make a token. Uh, if you have, a like, a creature, make a token, and then put two counters on it and just make it a little bit bigger. Um, that's also going to be good. Uh, I think what's good in this deck is, is the Offspring, because those will come in as one ones, and then you can play this and you know make Ooh, them a little, yeah, make them bigger. Uh, so yeah, I think that's very good that offspring was not a, a green deck. I think that's why like it can fit really well if you play it with certain cards. Yeah, I and the last mode is actually pretty good too. Like you could remove three non-token artifacts. The fact that it's 
specifically non-token prevents this from being a feel bad because people might be like, okay, I'll just sack one of my treasure tokens or whatever. But no, the, the fact that it's non-token also is, is pretty good. It's, you know, you could re- uh, remove up to three problematic artifacts. It's pretty good. All right, uh, Jason, what do we got next? So next we have Scurry of Squirrels. It's for two and a green. It's a squirrel scout, uh, two, two with myriad, myriad. So it's whenever it attacks for each opponent other than the defending player, you create a token that's tapped and attacking the player. So, like, you attack somebody, uh, two token copies get made that attack the other players, but because this is myriad, myriad, each player, uh, except for the defending player, will get two tokens that are attacking them. Uh, And then it says, whenever Scurry of Squirrels deals combat damage to a player, put a plus one, plus one counter on target creature you control. I think it's just a cool funny little squirrel dude that's just gonna make more squirrels and it's it's good in a squirrel deck and um i mean it, in a creature deck it's fine i just think that there are better cards for a generic creature deck than this uh but in a squirrel deck this is really fun this has to be one of the best cards on the squirrel deck and then it also has to be so, 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 okay, if you're in, like, a specific token deck, right, and you're playing, like, Parallel Lives, Doubling Season stuff, the ones that you make from the doubling effects or, like, Anointed Procession or whatever, you don't have to sacrifice those, do you? Like, do you get to keep those? You, you, you get to keep any of the extra copies you make. This is insane. <laughs> you're going to get this huge army of tutus and then also be buffing up other creatures when they're dealing damage. The one downside is it is a 2-2, right, with no evasion, so it's going to be a little bit hard for it to guarantee to get in there, but I feel like in the decks that want this, you're at least going to be able to get a couple of them through. You know, it's funny you bring up evasion, because if you look at the art, something tells me tells Squirrel originally had flying and is a flying squirrel. And play test, play oh, to that would have been fun. Flying but squirrel. then they had to get rid of that because it was way too good to get nine flying squirrels with that trigger. Yeah, I don't know that uh, that's would be just fair. A theory, but uh it would have been funny. I'm a, I'm excited to try it in a in a token deck or or something like that. Uh this is definitely going in Stephen's squirrel deck. It's freaking insane. I'm pretty sure a All lot right. of these are. Yeah. Uh this is uh Swarm Yard Massacre for three black black. It's a sorcery that says create two one one green squirrel creature tokens. Then each creature that isn't an insect, rat, spider, or squirrel get minus one, minus one until end of turn for each creature you control that's an insect, rat, spider, or squirrel. So I usually don't like these kind of like board wipes that are only hitting or not hitting certain things, but these are like not super well played creature types. Like, I, I didn't fact check this, but I bet if you scroll through, like, the top creatures that people are just generically playing on EDH rec, not too many of them are, are hitting this, unless you are playing specifically a rat deck or specifically playing a spider deck. So I feel like if you are playing one of, especially the squirrel one, because the squirrel one goes so wide, I think as, if you are playing any of these creature types, this should be in the running for one of your board wipes. I think all four of these types are ones people like, but have historically not been very strong. So Rats is pretty them... good. There's like one or two versions of Rats that's pretty good if you do that specifically. Otherwise, it's kind of niche. But giving them a pretty good board wipe, I like. Yeah, really good card in, in Rat decks. Um, you know, there are Spider Golgari decks that, that are going to want this. Um so it's it's good, very limited, but it is good. All right, and we are finally here at the end. We have one last card, Preston. Take it away. What a one to end on, my God. <laughs> Sword of the Squeak for two mana, artifact equipment. Equip creature gets plus one, plus one for each creature you control with base power or toughness one. Whenever a hamster, mouse, rat, or squirrel you control enters or atta- enters, you may attach Sword of the Squeak to that creature, and then otherwise it's equipped too. This is going to be very good in some decks, because if you boost up your other creatures, this still works, because it just cares about their base power and toughness. So, um, yeah, I like this card. 
It's goes funny. good in the squirrel deck. Goes good in a lot of token decks, really. Oh my god, and it's hilarious. It's sort of the squeak. It's it's funny. It's it's just it's just another card that's hilarious. I like it. It's it's only good in certain decks. Uh, rat decks and squirrel decks really got a lot of love in this set. Um, but yeah, it's fun. It's a fun card. All right, we did it, boys. We f- <laughs> this was a long one. Oh my god. I'm not gonna lie. I have to pee so bad. Yeah, me too. Uh, well, guys, let us know in the comments what some of your favorite cards are uh, from Bloomboro Commander. Uh, this was. Uh, uh, let us also know what you think about this style of episode. This is different from us. I know, uh, like Command Zone and whoever does episodes like this. But let us know what you think. Uh, maybe we'll do this uh, again sometime. Uh, yeah, we'll see you next week for another Magic: The Gathering podcast and whatever the heck else we are up to in the meantime. So until next time, see ya.